everyone. Welcome to this edition of Capita's LinkedIn Live. Today, we're talking about everything employee share option and ownership programs in Malaysia. So I'm joined here by my good friend, Sean. Uh, Sean is a co-founding partner of Donovan Ho, a law practice based in Malaysia. Uh, Sean, really good to see you again. I know we caught up a couple of weeks ago, but thanks for joining us today to talk a little bit more. Yes, hi, Amit. Good to see you again. And yes, uh, thanks for having me on this show. Uh, we'll be happy to have a conversation with you on employee share options. Yeah. Awesome, mate. So look, I, I know like we talk about this all the time and we can spend hours. So they will probably try to limit the, the conversation to about, um, you know, 30 minutes or so. We have a lot to cover. Uh, we'll probably start high level and introduce the concept to the audience. But yeah, we'll definitely can cover some of the technical aspects in time. Uh, because we have a, actually quite diverse a range of audience today, Delhi from Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, India, all over the place. So I think there's general interest in employee ownership and equity intensive programs. So let's kind of start from the top. For those in the audience not too familiar with the concept of ESOs or uh, incentive programs, what, what, what are these? What are the share plans? How do they work? Can you just introduce the concept uh, to us? Yes, yeah, sure. So basically the concept of uh, an employee share plan, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's really uh, to allow an employee of an organization or a company a right or a chance to be a part of the company in terms of uh, shareholding or equity ownership, right? And um, this is, in fact, very, very unusual, uh, you know, not until uh, recently for even private companies to have that kind of um, opportunity for its employees to do so. All right. Mm -hmm. And I think the concept really is to align, you know, the company's goals, the founder's goals, along with um, the employee's uh, incentives. All right. Mm -hmm. So that once the employee is uh, financially, all right, even motivated and aligned with the company's success, well, then the theory is that uh, the employees, the, the founders, the directors, management will all pull towards the same direction and the same goal. Yeah. Look, so and that makes perfect sense, but I would kind of love to understand more of a localized insight. So obviously you run a law practice in Malaysia and you kind of work with large listed corporations, SME startups. So in terms of like employee ownership and employee equity programs, what's the scene like in Malaysia? Has it been quite prevalent? Do you feel like Malaysia is still catching up with the rest of the regions of the globe on this? Or is it quite prevalent? Like what are some of the trends you've been seeing over the last couple of years? Okay. Well, um, I started practice about 18, 19 years ago, and I still can recall in those days, uh, I, I had the opportunity to handle some advisory matters in the tax practice group. And in those days, um, you know, employee share schemes, uh, I, I've seen are only in the context of listed companies, public mm -hmm. listed companies in Malaysia, uh, as well as, you know, companies that are listed perhaps in the US that as New York Stock Exchange, uh, yeah. and and they have a subsidiary in Malaysia, mm -hmm. and in that context, they award you know the employees in Malaysia uh, share options of the U.S. listed company. So it has very much been um, just confined to companies listed on stock exchanges. Uh, however, over the past two decades, I've seen quite a change in the trend, where. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, first of all, I would say the startup scene or the venture capital-backed startups in Malaysia all right, have, in fact, taken the lead uh, to introduce employee share schemes for private unlisted companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, And uh, so much so that even certain VC funds make it almost mandatory to yeah. have the table carve out a certain percentage. All right, Each time there's a fundraising, they will say, look, reserve a portion of your share capital for employees. And we see that quite often. Uh, and in the more recent times, um, I would say that more and more the brick and mortar SME type mm -hmm. of uh, businesses are then starting to also look towards how the VC funded companies are doing it. And uh, we've been receiving more and more inquiries for your, from traditional SME owners, you know, on, on tailoring uh, a, a, an employee share scheme that is suitable for them, all right? Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of trend, this is what I've seen. So I would say right now in, in Malaysia, uh, based on what I see in the startup scene, it's very, very well accepted. Um, mm -hmm. Founders are well aware of it already, uh, become an expectation for certain investors. 
uh, in the SME market, you know, it's it's gaining more interest. How, how about yeah. yourself? Uh, perhaps you can share a, a, a little bit about the regional perspective. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so I think it's very similar for us. Um, obviously, employee share plans have been around for decades. In some jurisdictions, are a bit more prevalent than common uh, and well understood, not just by the companies, but the employees. Um, what we're seeing, and we do a lot of our work you know, in Southeast Asia, specifically in the region where we're both located. And, uh, there's still quite a lot of um, effort that everyone, so both of us, our organizations, everyone in the industry should do to uh, increase education and awareness of this. But as some of the trends you mentioned, like we're actually seeing it a little bit more. So originally, uh, uh, listed companies, that's where you see you know, equity programs. And my personal experience, I started working, supporting a lot of the listed organizations. But you're exactly right, like with an increase in uh, P and VC investment and listed space is becoming more prevalent. And also, which is actually not surprising seeing these kind of schemes pop up in more kind of traditional SME family owned businesses as well, because yeah. a lot of people actually do want to uh, bring people along and create that sense of ownership, right? So that's the thing we believe in. We're definitely kind of seeing a, a, a lot of this. Uh, having said that, each jurisdiction is fairly unique. Right. So it's really hard. You can't really just go and see what people are doing in you know, yeah, Singapore, kind of Indonesia, India, Australia, US yeah. and try to replicate it in the Malaysian market because it's a um, you know, it's quite unique. There's uh, different rules. And so we can talk a little bit uh, about this mm -hmm. later. But there's definitely a lot more interest. There's a lot more kind of capital looking to be allocated by investors in Malaysian startups. So we kind of see the uptrend. So that's why it's a, a interesting market that we're quite invested in and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, do try to support a lot more. Um, Sean, like what I want to kind of talk to you about next is um, when you think about the entire life cycle, let's maybe start from day one. So mm -hmm. if you are a startup, SME, early stage companies, and you've kind of came across this concept, oh, this makes sense. You can help motivate my employees, improve performance. Everyone's engaged. Sounds good. How do you go about setting it up? Like what's the kind of checklist or steps that companies need to follow to design and roll out the scheme? Well, uh, that's a good question, Amit. Um, I would say really the first and probably the most important and time-consuming part mm. of things would be really to equip oneself with the knowledge of what these plans are. And yep. my, there are several types of plans, right, as you, you may yeah. be aware. right? It's not just employee share option plan, but there are other various permutations. Mm -hmm. So I think knowing what each plan involves what mm -hmm. the consequences are, what it means to your particular company, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of how you think it can then reward or motivate the recipient uh, would be important. Uh, knowing you know, how it will impact eventually your control or ownership over the company, and that's where the cap table and your services come in uh, to, to facilitate that. That's also important. Uh, knowing you know, the obligations uh, of the not just the recipient, but also mm -hmm. the company issuing these uh, uh, incentives, it's very important, uh, and that includes you know the legal aspects and the tax aspects of of, of such obligations. All right, so I, I think understanding it, being familiar with it, uh, we we find ourselves as practitioners spending a lot of time, you know, addressing mm -hmm. uh, very specific questions that. Uh, come from the management team, okay, yes. even those that are already familiar with the concept, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they foresee what the different scenarios could be, you know, what happens if there's a restructuring, what happens if there's an M&A, what happens mm -hmm. in the next fundraising round, and yeah. I think these are really, really important because mm -hmm. uh, each company, each business has a very different path, very different direction, uh, mm -hmm. the founders also perceive, uh, you know, the risk and reward differently. So I would say planning stage ultimately is it's it almost takes up like maybe seventy percent of the, the time, yeah. uh, and then after that, after the planning is done, you know, to engage uh, in in, in uh, conversations with advisors who are familiar yeah. with this specific area and has experience in this area, uh, then it will be to really draft out the key documents, mm -hmm. right? And um, this can appear quite simple. Basically, the key document uh, that regulates. This entire exercise is what we call the bylaws. Essentially, they are just terms and conditions uh, mm. that regulate this scheme. All right. However, that again, uh, the devil's in the details. I would say uh, the bylaws, as much as we have, uh, you know, templates that we start with, and then our market practice, you know, for every single 
exercise that we do, we spend a lot of time to listen and understand the founders' needs and customize these bylaws uh, to the requirements of the company. Um, and in this stage, once the bylaws are drafted, then uh, it, it goes through share, shareholder approval, board approval, and where there are investors, the investors would probably insist on having a look through them to give their mm -hmm. input. Uh, the company secretary will be roped in to pass the resolutions. The tax agent will be roped in you know, to prepare the necessary reporting to the Inland Revenue. Uh, so that's the launch, launch stage preparation mm -hmm. for launch. Um, the next stage would naturally be then to actually launch the, the plan to the company uh, or to the potential recipients. And I think on, on this uh, part of things, I mean, happy to hear you elaborate a little bit more, but I understand most companies, they convene a town hall meeting to, mm -hmm. to launch it, take everyone through the FAQs. Um, you know, some are just a bit more cozy, a bit more one-to-one -one with their management yep. team. Yeah. Um, is, yeah. is this how you've seen launches done? I mean, for us, we, yeah. we don't participate too much in the launches. So happy to hear from you how it's done. No, that, that, that's exactly right. I think the way you described it, you know, makes perfect sense. So that's how I like to think of it. It's like a lot of the initial effort is for the company, for the founders, for the management leadership to actually understand what they're doing, right? And ultimately, the scheme is just a tool to achieve the goals that you have. Right? So the first questions you ask, okay, like, what is it that we're trying to do? They want to retain people, they want to attract people, they want to encourage performance, right? Once you kind of formulate that and that the kind of discovery process is the bulk of it, then the next one is creation of the scheme as well. So by that time, everything approvals are obtained, then the company, you know, as the issuer, has a pretty good understanding, okay, we know what we've done, we know how it works, we know all the applications, you mentioned like tax law, securities law, exchange controls, all that kind of stuff comes into play. But the most important thing is the whole point of creating a scheme is to reward your employees. All right. So the critical part sometimes is overlooked to say, hey, we created the scheme, we got your whole level approval, we're done, all good to go. And you're going to issue letters to the employees, but only get it or value it, right? So that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Yeah, so that's yeah. why, like, we're, we're, we're trying to encourage more, um, you know, companies spend probably even more effort, not just on the the compulsory background work of creating the scheme and designing it and getting all the legal and tax checked off. But ultimately, mm -hmm. how do you kind of communicate it, right? And the communication we feel needs to be kind of regularly consistent coming from the top, all right? Because what you want to be doing is that, hey, by participating in this scheme, whether it's options, you know, other instrument share rights, restricted shares, whatever it looks like, ultimately kind of gives you an ability to be rewarded from company's performance, All right? So it's kind of important to link to, to the company's goals and objectives. You know, what we're trying to do and grow, these are our objectives. And the reason mm -hmm. why we created the scheme is to help you participate in that growth and ultimately benefit of it, right? So if you kind of link it and help people understand what the goals are, we're trying to achieve your role into it, they can actually link it directly and kind of value what they're receiving a bit more. And they'll be like, hey, okay, look, if I work hard, company does well. If company does well, maybe a share price valuation increases. I have an interest in that. So I'm actually going to benefit. Because making that link can be actually a little bit tricky and not quite intuitive, especially in the listed space when you can't just look up the share price on exchange to know what the value is. So that's why communicating the value and valuations and how it all works is quite tricky. Yeah, so for the launches, yeah, like town halls, Regular communications, emails, providing visibility, we feel it's quite important, right? So that's why it's a, it's not just a function or responsibility of like HR reward team. I think it needs to come from founders, leadership, executives. Yeah. Everyone in the business needs to be, uh, you know, singing the same song. That's what we feel. Yeah, absolutely. And and I just to add on to that, it's mm -hmm. it's not just like a one off exercise, right? And and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know the, the the plan might be launched and. You might do a town hall to communicate things, uh, but it's also an ongoing effort, right? Ongoing sure. communication, uh, you know, from management to to the, the recipients, mm -hmm. and and when you know the the, the the major milestones are hit, you know, a new fundraising round is hit, or a mm -hmm. potential M and A is around the corner. Then again, the communication comes in, you know, a potential IPO listing. I think this continuous communication does present an opportunity, in fact, for management to update. The, the team, you know, okay, we're on track, you know, and this is what we see in the horizon. And uh, hopefully, you know, depending on the style of the management, they might be uh, comfortable to share some figures or, or valuation yeah. figures, uh, yeah. which really supercharge and motivate the team as well. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so look, so I think we've kind of covered like sort of the conceptual part of it. There are 
kind of the initial steps in designing and rolling it out. I think it's also important to keep perspective um, of what happens after that. Because in nature, equity compensation is long-term, right? So you need to think long-term, right? It's not about ticking the box, getting it in place. Mm -hmm. um, there's like a few things that come into play after that, right? So what are some of the things maybe like the funders legislation needs to keep in mind? Because obviously you mentioned already like some tax reporting obligations, there may be some payroll reporting, there's some accounting implications. Like, do you want to maybe highlight a few things that you feel it's important not to forget about and kind of plan ahead? Uh, as you kind of manage your existing scheme once you've rolled it out? Yeah, great question. I, I think this is really not a set and forget type of an exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, as you correctly mentioned, you know, a, a few people in the management team are really key. The HR person is important there uh, to be aware, you know, of, of course, performance of the recipients, all right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not uh, the recipient, if uh, he or she does decide to leave the organization, then it has to be triggered uh, whether or not this recipient holding uh, options which may have been vested or not yet. What happens to these options, right? Uh, is he or she leaving as a good lever or bad lever? Uh, you know, could there be potential disputes even in a, in a bad lever scenario? You know, would there be difficulty for the company to wrestle back the shares uh, if they have already been exercised? So I think this... Uh, issues do come about for uh, a company that has already rolled out these uh, share options. Uh, in terms of finance, I, I suppose um, I, I see this also come about uh, quite frequently where, uh, like you mentioned just now, for private unlisted companies, mm -hmm. uh, the tricky thing is always to determine the share valuation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not possible to check it live every day on the stock market. And in Malaysia, you know, uh, for tax purposes, the mm -hmm. Indian revenue requires uh, the company to determine the share valuation based on audited fi uh, financial accounts, not mm -hmm. just management accounts. So the finance team has to be aware of this. Uh, mm -hmm. And certain auditors, the private auditors and accountants also do uh, recommend the company do a valuation even on an annual basis. So I, I think that one, perhaps you can comment a little bit more on that. Uh, but I think they do have some basis to 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 uh, state that. So I think from the financial finance perspective as well, you know how the plans are being treated, you know up, upon issuance prior to vesting, you know how are they classified or captured in the books of mm. the company? Um, I think this this also raises uh, questions on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. There's there's a few things to keep in mind. So if it's touched on. Um, obviously, from a company's perspective, you know, the ongoing relation obligations, financial reporting based on the accounting standard that your company is in. So it's MFRS2 in Malaysia. You might be a foreign company, so employees in Malaysia, that's also a little bit different. Um, you know, employee tax implications, payroll reporting is quite important to understand because ultimately, you know, part of compensation, uh, any tax authority around the world, they likely want their cut, you know, based on the income tax. Because if you're going to get a compensation, it may not be salary and wages in form of cash, but you still receive an asset in the form of, you know, securities or shares, right? So how's it going to tax? Very important for you to understand and also educate your employees. So and, I think like the just, tax element is, is quite important. Yeah. yeah. And since you've raised that up, I think also another thing we've come across, um, you know, in, in planning out these uh, schemes for, mostly startups are, are mm. you know, the changing landscape of talent, you know, and mm. it's it's so often that we see, you know, uh, talent being located abroad, especially, you know, tech talent. They could be yeah. located in Vietnam, in Russia, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. in Philippines, and they receive these uh, options, right? And they're all over the place in the world. So mm. I think the, the changing, the, the very mobile nature of employees, mm. right? Uh, do give rise to uh, a unique set of uh, challenges for mm -hmm. a company to award these options uh, to its employees who are constantly moving. And, and I think tax is certainly one of the, the, the key um, things to think about uh, if and when the, 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 there's a secondment or, or there's an award to employees who yeah. are out of the country or who move around throughout the year. Yeah, for sure. Because like uh, the important thing is like depending where your employees are based, right? This is where the rules kick in for them, right? So in some countries, you can't even easily give away options. You have to use different instruments because you need to get exemptions or approvals. So you have to go through, 
you know, uh, a local banking or SEC equivalents, right? To different jurisdictions. It's not quite straightforward. So I guess that's a an important kind of thing you've raised. And so maybe like for the audience, we've talked about conceptually, but in terms of practical things in Malaysia for Malaysian police, for Malaysian companies, what are maybe like some of the things that usually catches people off guard that not be aware of? Maybe anything around securities law or tax, like what do you find are the most common kind of uh, hurdles that companies need to be mindful of and overcome? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I could spend an hour yeah, or so on this. Whole list, but uh, maybe, you know, a couple, a couple examples will be great, I think. <laughs> Top, top, uh, top three. Okay, I, I would say the most common uh, mm -hmm. encounter I have uh, that uh, I, I, I almost always have to address is, um, you know, management or, or people coming to me with already a, a, a certain preconceived understanding of uh, how these options work, and uh, not not surprisingly, they their understanding is based on what they read online, all right, mm -hmm. in Google. And a lot of times, the schemes or their understanding of such schemes uh, derive from practices from Silicon Valley, all right, for yeah. example, and how they structure their vesting dates, you know, um, and, and the implications of following this kind of uh, vesting period, uh, how they structure this actually can be very different. And, and most of the time, they find it quite surprising that uh, the implications in following such a a vesting date structure can be very far from what they actually thought they, they knew. Okay, uh, just to, to give you an example on that, um, a, a lot of times uh, uh, clients come to us thinking that, okay, I, I just want my options to vest over four years, okay, and with, with you know, 25% each year, all right? And uh, in their mind, they, 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 they think that, okay, once the options have vested, they will be ready to be exercised. Uh, however, uh, what hadn't occurred to them is really what happens if the recipient really does exercise it and become a member of the company as a shareholder, mm -hmm. and you multiply that by, let's say, 10, 20, 30 participants, all right, then this begs the question of how would you be able to control these shareholders? Do you need a separate vehicle, a separate entity? Do you need uh, somebody to hold these shares on trust for them? Uh, what happens if they leave? Do you buy the shares back? All right. Um, and from the tax angle, you know, uh, a lot of them are quite surprised that the employees themselves get taxed at the point of exercise. Mm. All right. Yep. So I think this is where, uh, yeah, I think the most frequent thing we have to do is just to reprogram and just reset, you know, any uh, basic understanding that of clients that come to us. And just yeah, malignize uh, it, basically. Yeah. No, no, no. You're exactly right. So there's a, there's a usually the tech stuff that is quite tricky for people to understand if you're not really, you know, operate in this space uh, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. So yeah. So look, we don't want to scare everyone in the audience, like saying it's it's so tricky and it's a complete mess. You shouldn't do it. You know, you definitely you can kind of go through it and navigate the, the hurdles. So maybe uh, let, let, let's put a positive spin on this conversation. You know, there's some challenges, but it's definitely like some benefits. So maybe Sean, like in your experience, you work with so many companies like over the years, right? Do you have any example? Like obviously, you don't, don't feel don't feel like you are obliged to disclose any names, but any good examples, case studies of how some companies in Malaysia were successful implementing it? You know, maybe some success stories or something you found quite interesting, unique. I would love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> trust the lawyer to bring up all the scary stuff, right? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> as, that's why. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's what we deal with day in, day out. But in terms of the positive success stories, I, I do have one in mind. Um, and over the past, you know, like seven, eight years of doing ESOS, I've only ever come across this one instance uh, where uh, this is a late stage uh, startup that has gone through several rounds of fundraising already. And um, uh, this, this, the founders of this company has, had very generously actually awarded uh, stock options out to it's not just the membership uh, the management team but also mm -hmm. some middle management. So I could tell from the, the, the speaking to the founder and, and well advising them, uh, they they actually went through a sale so a, a MA mm -hmm. exercise. Yeah. So in a sense, this company had an exit, right? Not through the listing process. 
but it was a bigger regional uh, company that acquired them. And uh, in this context, it was really interesting in advising the founders because um, there was a lot of uh, excitement, but also responsibility on the founders' shoulders in negotiating this buyout where mm. what stood out was that they constantly, you know, question what would the implications to our, our, our option holders, our, you know, uh, what would this m and mean for our option holders? And I could tell he was genuinely very concerned that he wanted to make sure they were not shortchanged, okay, in this exit, uh, that whoever, you know, whatever that he had promised, which may or may not have been in writing, there's a lot of that that happens, all right, mm -hmm. uh, that was honored by the acquirer. And also not just that, uh, it was also a push and pull because on the buyer side, right, they were then concerned, okay, uh, have you been overly generous with your terms? Uh, what happens if I honor this uh, this terms and, and half, half the company leaves after, you know, I, I, I take you over? Uh, and then how do I then retain or how do we then uh, repackage or uh, transfer all these benefits under the share option scheme to the acquirer's existing share option scheme? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it was at the end of the day, a successful sale. So the sale completed. Uh, it was announced in the news. Um, and I would say it, it's a happy ending for everybody, yeah. including the founder, the management team and the option holders. Um, I would say that to me is really a success story because it actually amounted to uh, cash in the pockets of the mm. recipients because a lot of times it's just paper, right? It's just, oh, mm. we've got this many options or shares worth this amount. It seems very impressive, but actually there's no cash involved. Um, I think that to me was a really an eye-opener uh, and was a success story uh, in, the, in the context of a buyout. How about yourself? I mean, I mean, have you have you seen uh, any IPO related uh, success stories or M and A related ones? Yeah, so for sure, I, th I think over the years I got a chance to kind of uh, see the good and the bad, and a lot of the cases. Like one of the things, like I really believe in, is kind of um, equity programs across an organization at all levels. Um, so traditionally, I think a lot of business is going to give it to the, you know, this you know senior management executives because they kind of really drive the top line, the success of the business. But I think there's a lot of value giving it to everyone. So I remember like when I first started my career and then I got to participate in Australia, there's this concept of like a thousand dollar salary sacrifice. So you can receive one thousand dollars worth of shares. And so you sacrifice some salary and then company matches a little bit. And I got a couple of shares in the company, like and I feel like pretty excited. It's like, hey, I'm a shareholder of my own company, right? So I can I can tell everyone I'm an owner. It doesn't really quite work this way in, in practice, because obviously you're a Far, very far from majority but then for me like it actually kind of made a difference i actually you know felt like a bit more connected to the business right and i think i've had a chance like every single company i work with i've had some sort of a stake in the business like through equity programs as well right and i think it really makes a difference right and ultimately when you're going to bring in at all levels of organizations that's kind of like the definition of success a default in terms of distribution but on, on your question about the exit and ultimate benefit of receiving cash for that in a listed company, it's a lot easier because you can easily transact post-vesting or post-exercise, depending on the instrument. In a listed space, it's a bit more tricky. So on the success stories we're seeing, because we work with a lot of companies to help facilitate liquidity before the exit. Because right. the challenge is in a listed, listed space, your IPO may happen like you know, 10, 12, 14 years after incorporation. M&A, if you're lucky, may happen a couple of years down the track, but it's not guaranteed. So let's say the scenario like your your startup has been around for like five, six years. You have some early employees sitting on, you know, equity that's worth something on paper, but there's no ability to do that. The success stories we're seeing is the companies actually facilitate more regular uh, liquidity programs in-house, right? And also mm -hmm. like the success stories, I don't think it needs to be like an ultimate massive payout of every employee gets millions of dollars. I think that success can be brought on early in conversation. So you know, your, your company has been around for a couple of years. You know, your let's say you show you received a hundred options, maybe you know, 50 of them have vested, the rest have remaining invested. It doesn't mean you need to have ability to cash out the entire 50. Companies can run like small liquidity programs maybe once a year to allow you to sell maybe like five or ten percent of your vested stake. What it does, it actually makes it more real, right? You yeah. don't cash out, you still have the further upside, but you have ability to, you know, 
help you know buy something for your kids or family or contribute to like a house deposit or rent or a holiday or something i, th I think that's kind of the definition of success and we're kind of seeing that a lot more yeah. right? and there's a lot more companies doing that in malaysia and everywhere else right like i think that's going to become the norm because i think that notion you mentioned like okay it has something that's worth it but what does it actually mean like the success yeah. we're seeing in industry overall is that more companies can be like okay well we actually wanted to make it a bit more real for companies. So what can we do about it? You know, what are the ways we can actually facilitate and reward employees, not just at the ultimate end, which everyone aspires to, but also down the track, right? So so to me, that's kind of like where I, I see more success stories recently on a smaller scale, but ultimately it all adds up and makes it more meaningful for everyone that participates, yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think that is really uh, very practical and uh, well, this is not a planted question. You didn't tell me to ask this, but I'm just wondering, uh, does Capita then facilitate in this possibility of having liquidity even uh, prior to an M&A or IPO? And, and how yeah, correct. That? Yeah. So there's like many different ways to facilitate that, right? So the liquidity can come in many forms, right? It could be as simple as internal payroll cash out, right? So you're sitting on some asset options, right? And we have some cash sitting in our balance sheet, maybe as part of the fundraiser from, because, you know, the, the business domain we very well, we want to reward my employees. So, you know, I'd say, why don't I swap your five asset options for equivalent dollar value and pay you out as part of payroll. Effectively, it works like salary and wages as a bonus payment, but it's linked to your underlying equity. So it's sometimes it's called cash settlement surrender. So these kind of programs like we help facilitate. There it can be more complex scenarios you can run when you may potentially involve like external third parties, existing investors. So they can be more complex and it's usually quite more regulated. But the things we're kind of doing a little bit more, you know, on our platform for the clients are the, you know, facilitating these kind of internal cash settlement process for the employees. Like we're seeing a bit more of that. And it kind of tends to be uh, well, well, um, well received, obviously, by employees, but also becoming more prevalent. Like interestingly, like, like India is a very developed market in that sense. So if you follow like startup news in India, you're always gonna read news about sort of ESO buybacks, all right? So they may not technically be buybacks if you get very technical, because you know buybacks is you know, getting securities and cancel them, right? But it's actually a cash settlement, like this kind of mechanism, right? And be, because it's becoming so more prevalent, all employees actually are aware of it, how it works, anticipate it. So there's a lot more benefit to that. So we kind of started to see that more happening in sort of Southeast Asia as well. And there's some actually public case studies in, in Malaysia as well in, in recent recent months and years. I, I hope to see that more in Malaysia as well, because I yeah. can really imagine how that would bring a lot more meaning to the option holder. And, and you know, it can really be a, a, a huge incentive uh, for real, not just on paper. So yeah, I hope to see that more in, in Malaysia as well. Yeah. No, for, for, for sure. Um, no, so look, um, John, I think that was a, a super helpful. And look, I know we can keep going for, um, for, for, for you know, hours talking about this. Uh, I think when I kind of sort of wrap up our conversation, like, so kind of reflect on everything we've touched on, you know, theoretical stuff or con conceptual, some practical tips, the life cycle of going through this. Um, any sort of like parting advice you have for, founders, leaders in the business, even employees who are tuning in and trying to understand this, what do you think like people should keep in mind and take away from this conversation? Mm. Yeah, well, I think um, just not to belabor the point, the, the planning, the technicalities, you know, um, just being very aware of the consequences, uh, positive and negative, you know, in introducing mm -hmm. and managing such a scheme is highly important. Uh, apart from that, I would also say that, you know, um, not, not, treating this exercise as a, a silver bullet, right? It won't solve all your problems or it, that alone won't motivate your employees uh, or your recipients uh, to no end. You know, um, communication is certainly a point that you, you've mentioned. That is for sure very important. Uh, handling the situation, giving updates, uh, you know, managing the, the expectations of, of the recipients in order to really harness the full uh, effect Okay, of having such a program, um, you know, and uh, essentially just keeping this, uh, treating the, the, the group of uh, holders or recipients as if they were a shareholder. I think that would be a good general approach, you know, uh, yeah. uh, to, to take. Yeah, so I think uh, parting advice, you know, of course, find the right people to, to get advice from. Uh, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. And that's something mm. I've 
also like to to add on. You know, uh, don't overcomplicate the 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 plan. Keep it simple where where possible. All right, as long as it fits your needs, don't overcomplicate it. Um, and oh yeah, of course, uh, you know, in terms of managing the cap table, uh, have tools. You know, um, yeah, just like what capital you guys offer, I think that's very useful. Uh, that I would say is also worth uh, exploring after the plan is then uh, launched. Yeah. yeah, so those are my parting words. Yeah, yeah for sure, Sean. And and uh, while you were speaking, I noticed there was a question from some of the you know audience, Joseph, and he was asking about. You know, if there's equivalent service like eTrade to make it easy for you know employees to invest and transact, right? So, so the, yes and no. As an ultimate, I think we've kind of alluded to that we do facilitate some transactions. I think it's important to know that you know equity in nature when you look at bylaws and the scheme rules, it's not it's part of your computation, so you can't just easily get rid of. So a lot of these kind of ability to cash out needs to be facilitated by the business. So a lot of it is run initiated by, by the company. But yeah, there's definitely ways to design these programs and there's definitely ways to manage it in-house or obviously, you know, we have vested, no pun intended, interest uh, in this with Capital Mobile we'll Provide. So yeah, so Joseph, more than happy for uh, to chat, uh, chat, chat, chat a little bit more about this. Uh, for anyone else in the audience, if you have any follow-up questions uh, for you, Sean, what will be the best way for you um, for them to reach out to you? Is it LinkedIn, email, find uh, Donovan and the host website? What will be the email? Preferred? All three. Yeah. All three? Um, well, I preferred will be an email, which is yeah. uh, shawn at dnh.com.my. But you can reach out to me through LinkedIn. It's fine, too. Awesome, Sean. So, look. Uh, let's let's leave it there. I appreciate your time. It's always good to see you in chat. Um, so I think we've uh, uh, shared quite a lot of good insights. Um, on this note, I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in in today's Capita's LinkedIn Live. We've covered everything there is to know about ESOS in Malaysia. Uh, keep an eye on future editions of uh, our sessions. Next week, we'll be tuning in live from Adelaide, South Australia. It's a South Starts Festival to bring in closer to the action. Um, but this note, we'll end it there. Thanks again, Sean, and see you Thank all. Thank you, Amit. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye.